Hi everyone, I'm Allie Pinion with Dreaming the Bee, and I would like to talk to you today a little bit about bee-centric beekeeping. So I like to work with bees in a way that is more bee-friendly rather than what can I get from the bees. And I think that bees can um, offer us a, a wonderful, deep relationship and more of a connection to our own selves as well as to everything around us. I think that when we work with bees in a bee-centric way, then we are in a more um, gentle place with ourselves and with the world around us. I think that bees encourage us to move slowly, to move gently, to plant more flowers, to find places that we can offer water for wildlife and pollinators. I think that they encourage us to plant our world in, in, in flowers and fruit. And so today I wanted to talk about um, some of the equipment that we work with as, as beekeepers or as bee guardians as I prefer to say. Um, this is just a, a simple veil and this is what I like to wear most of the time because it is a protection for our, our eyes, our ears, our mouths because bees like to go in dark holes. You know, they might try to fly in your nose or your eye. Um, they also like to get, they don't really care for hair so they might kind of buzz around in your hair and this is a protectant for all of those things and also we're in the sun a lot as beekeepers so having a nice wide brimmed um, sun hat is is really a, a great um, option and um, I also have a, a jacket and a be jacket that's more protective and it will protect my my whole arms and um, chest and belly area and my back but I only really wear this suit when I'm um, removing bees from their homes um, like if there's bees that have moved into a, a side of a house and um, a family wants them removed then I'll use this suit because the bees are going to be more upset but if you, if you find that, um, you know, you're moving slowly, you're moving gently, you're talking to the bees, you are um, being really respectful of them, and you've had some experience working with bees, then all you really need is a veil. Um, I also believe that just working a veil, just wearing a veil encourages us to work in a more um, slow, precise, thought out, and gentle manner because we are less protected. And I feel like when we're more protected, we, can, we feel like we can be a little more rough and move through the hives a little more quickly. And um, so I like to um, encourage people that feel comfortable with it to not wear gloves, to not wear um, a full suit when they feel ready for that. Um, and if you are interested in wearing gloves, then I think that uh, a nice pair of goat skin gloves work really well. And, um, but you'll find that gloves can be very cumbersome and it's hard to, to work in the hive with them and move around in the hive with gloves. I uh, usually don't wear gloves and um, if I'm doing an extraction sometimes I will put on um, like some rubber gloves that can be disposed of um, and I really don't like to use disposable products which is why I don't wear the gloves very often but when you are you know covered in honey and propolis um it's kind of hard to work sometimes without using some some rubber gloves um and just because you're really super sticky um so yeah that's that's what i like to to use as protective equipment um and i really think that you know the sensitive beekeeper the bee centric beekeeper learns to work without without gloves so that they can more gently feel their way through the hive. 
And, um, you know, one of the more famous parts of, of beekeeping is the smoker. And I, um, I don't really use the smoker a whole lot because it can interfere with the bees' um, alarm pheromones. And, um, well, that's the reason why people use it, is to interfere with that alarm pheromone so that the bees kind of calm down a little bit. And that alarm pheromone is a, is a scent that the bees will put out to let their sister bees know that, you know, someone is invading the hive and this kind of masks that smell. Um, there's also some people that believe that it makes bees think that there's a forest fire and so they go inside the hive, they gorge themselves on honey and prepare to be hunkered down into the hive. Um, I use smoke when I'm trying to move bees from one box to another, when I'm trying to move them out of a, a cavity if I'm doing an extraction. Um, so I do think there are appropriate places for smoke. Um, a lot of times the bees want to hang out on the top of the hive and if you want to put the inner cover or the cover on and um, you can't get the bees to move, you know, you can smoke them a little bit to um, get them to move into the hive and it's not so startling for them. But also just that smell of just pumping the, um, without there being a fire in it, just pumping the smoker can kind of move that smoke, that char smell. Um, you don't want to move, use smoke around frames that have honey on it because the honey can take up the smell of the smoke. Um, so we'll talk about the hive tool. Um, this is an Italian hive tool, which I really, really like. Um, it's nice and thin. It's got a little J-hook on the end so that I can pry between um, between frames. This is another uh, type of hive tool that you know has more of a flat, wider end, and then kind of a pry met, uh, bar at the other end, which is very, very useful. Um, but I just really like the thin sleekness of this hive tool. I also feel, find that it's important to paint them bright colors um, because they will fall out of your bags and get lost. Um, another thing I always like to keep on me is a, a notebook so that I can record uh, what's going on in each hive and keep good records. Um, and then I have a, a queen cage, queen kennel. And what this is, is so that if I'm catching a swarm or removing a colony from um, an extraction in a building, or if I'm doing a hive split, um, which is where I take part of the hive and um, divide it into two, and I, I can put the queen in here, she can't get out, but her attendants or um, the worker bees can, can get out. When I am working a hive before I enter the hive I like to take a few calming breaths to center myself um, bees can really sense uh, your emotions and they can smell fear they can sense fear and so if you take a moment to kind of center yourself and calm yourself and take a few breaths with the bees um, and another thing I forgot to mention is that the bees have this, um, the bees are a super organism, which means one bee can't live alone. They actually live as a cohesive unit. So they have a queen, they have about 20 to 30% male bees, and then the rest female bees are worker bees, and, or sister bees, I like to call them. And um, they have this energetic field that, that they can sense when, um, something is around their hive and just as like you know you can sense when someone's standing behind you it's kind of that sort of that same thing and as a bee goes to fly out to a flower or a source of water their energetic field is kind of extending to that bee and then it comes back so I think it's important that when we're coming to the the space of the bees that in particular because we walk up behind them a lot of times is to kind of talk to them and tell them you know that you're coming uh, tell them what you're going to do 
I like to put my hands on top of the hive and um, hum three times and take three deep breaths before I enter a hive and also kind of picture in my mind what I'm going to do and 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 send that picture down into the hive so that they they know what's going on and if I open the hive and I sense that they are not ready for what I'm about to, to do with them then I will actually stop and um, come back to them another day um, it doesn't always work out that way sometimes a big storm's coming and I want to get them into a better hive or you know something um, but I try to to work with the bees as much as possible so if you want to take a pause and a breath with me and hum you can Okay. It's important that you move very slowly in the beehive. When you take the top off, you just kind of allow that top to uh, sit it off to the side, but allow the bees to know um, that someone's coming in if you just give them kind of a moment to to understand what's going on. A lot of times you'll hear a, a crack in the propolis um, so you know just allow the bees to hear that give them a moment and then you can keep working the colder the weather gets the louder that propolis crack can be and the more startling it can be and so we want to be nice and gentle and this is a, a layens style hive this is a french style hive and it um, i prefer these style hives because they are horizontal rather than vertical which allows for the bees and, and which allows the, for the bees to draw their comb much deeper um, rather than wider and it also prevents me from having to lift really heavy boxes So this colony um, was an extraction from someone's roof. Um, so it's not a very strong colony, um, but I want to get it out of this smaller box and and put it into a larger box so that the bees can have more space to grow and these uh, funny looking cells here are actually supersedure cells so they're trying to raise a new queen and we call that superseding so here we have the queen and you can see that her abdomen is quite a bit longer than the sister bees around her. And so in the spring, up until mid-June, she will lay thousands of eggs a day. And she will mate 
with about anywhere from two dozen to four dozen male bees and after June her her slow her nectars the nectar starts to slow down and pollen and so her laying starts to slow down and so here we can see a lot of the sister bees these are a lot of nurse bees and what they're doing is tending the babies in these cells so the capped cells here are all baby bees that are getting ready to hatch out and then they will actually clean out the cell that they were in previously and they will then begin to nurse the other bees around them and the bees progress from job to job where they'll be carrying out dead bees um, they'll be receiving honey and pollen from the foragers they will be dehydrating the nectar in the cells and then they will go out to become foragers and up here you can see there's a little bit of capped honey hmm. let's see if we can see it better on this side yes here this is capped honey that light color And this is definitely not the healthiest of hives. This was an extraction that my friend did. And the reason, one of the reasons why we can tell this is their brood pattern is very spotty. Even though there are lots of baby bees in the cells here, um, this colony is not a very strong colony and, and may not make it. And it's sad, but it is important that we continue on the genetics of bees that are resistant to the varroa mites that we have issues with here and I have to remind myself that when I when I lose a colony that it is it's for the greater good of all the bees because I don't I don't treat my bees with with pesticides I try to let nature do its thing so that the healthy, strong bees survive. This is a really great example of brood and honey here. This is a good, pretty good laying pattern and you can see it's kind of stacked like a brick house. And that's what we want it to look like. That's a good, healthy brood pattern. The cells that look like popcorn, those are male bees, the drone bees, and they're bigger, and that's why they're more risen than the sister bees' cells. And so they don't have a lot of honey reserves, and the reason for that is possibly because they... Um, they lost a lot of their foraging bees when they were extracted from the house or the roof of the house. And so they do have foraging bees now. And the foraging bees job is to go and collect nectar, collect water, uh, collect pollen, and they even collect the enzymes from mushrooms as part of their health their health care plan. <laughs> okay. And on this frame here, we can see capped brood. We can see honey here at the top. And we can also see in these cells there's different colors of pollen and that pollen 
once it gets fermented with a little bit of the bees enzymes from their digestive system we call it bee bread and so you can see the little cells with a different color pollen in them and here is a bee right here that has pollen on its legs those little orange dots we call them um, pollen baskets And here you can see a really young baby bee that's just emerged that has lots of fur on her body. And as the bees get older, they lose a lot of that fur. And that fur is there to help them catch pollen as they're going through the different plants to visit for nectar and pollen as well. And then you can see the, the shininess in the cells. That's pollen that has, I mean, that's nectar that has yet to be dehydrated into honey. And I like to allow the bees to draw their own comb because the comb is part of their um, communication system. And a lot of beehives will have plastic comb and that inhibits the Oh, I wanted to show you one more thing. That inhibits the communication systems between the bees. And here, the sticky residue that we have is resins from different trees. Um, they really prefer cottonwood trees, willow trees, and they take the resins and they line the inside of the cells with it. They line the inside of the hive with it. And it's called propolis. And it's actually their external immune system. And they will even make little channels of pollen through, uh, of propolis through the hive. And that is kind of like their, um, their medicinal herbal tea. It is their medicine and they will drink the, the dew that collects on it as part of their hive medicine. And propolis is also really, really good for human health. And it is an antiviral, antimicrobial, antibacterial. Um, the ancient Egyptians used to use it in mummification processes along with honey. It is really good for flus and um, colds. It helps kind of put a coat on your throat. And another reason that I feel it's really important to be gloveless when working with your bees is because you can feel their sense of urgency. You can feel them walking around on your fingers. Um, so, one of the reasons I really like these lay-in hives is because all the top part of the hive is, is covered. And when you open one of the box hives, one of the Langstroth hives, the whole, it's like taking the entire roof off of the house. And so, I feel like this kind of hive makes the bees a lot more, or encourages the bees to be a lot more gentle. Because we're not extracting their entire roof. If someone came into your home and took the roof off of your house, you might be a little upset too. So we could understand why the bees would get kind of upset. And this hive right here, is the larger layens hive which they'll move into once they get once they get a bigger colony but i like to keep the colony boxes the boxes size is small so that the bees don't have to defend as much area until the bees get big enough to to defend that space we don't want to give the bees any more work than than they need to have because they're busy enough 
And one of the common misconceptions about bees is that they work all the time. And that's not true. They actually take many rest breaks. You can find them sometimes sitting inside flowers or inside uh, the cells of the honeycomb taking a nap. Um, you, it's quite common to see bumblebees taking a nap in, in flowers. So I, I like to change the, the terminology of the worker bee to the sister bee because they're all sisters and they play a very important part, but they also know that it, rest is important. Rest is important for rejuvenation, for proper brain functioning, for hormone functioning. It's just really important to bring back that, um, that rest and um, the bees understand that and they take care of one another and they make sure that they all get a chance to rest. Another common misconception about bees is that the drone bees or the male bees are just lazy bees that do nothing. And so many beekeepers will actually cut drones out of the hive. And um, they do that because they believe that the drones just eat a lot of food and they um, cause issues with varroa mites. And I I believe that the drones are a really important part of the, uh, the superorganism that is the bee. And the drones actually help protect the hive. They will, a lot of times when you walk up to a beehive and you hear something really loud bouncing around your head um, in the spring, it's the drones. They are trying to, you know, get you to move away from the hive and they're protecting it. They also provide warmth and, and sing to the baby bees. Um, they go f are the only bees that are able to move from hive to hive. Um, if one of the sister bees went into a hive that wasn't her own, she'd be attacked. But the drone bees, the male bees, can go from hive to hive. So they kind of bring the scent, the scent which bees work a lot with, and the stories um, from hive to hive. They are this divine masculine presence within the hive, and um, I believe they have a very, very important part in the beekeeping world.